Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow on some really important topics. Um, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Hylesis Getahun, who is the Director of Antimicrobial Resistance Global Coordination at the World Health Organization in Geneva, and, and is also the head of the Quadripartite Joint Secretariat on Antimicrobial Resistance involving the World Health Organization, the World Organization of Animal Health, the United Nations Environment Program, and the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And to sort of bring a little of this into context, because we have touched on AMR a bit on a previous episode, uh, this is an area which in 2019, there were over 1.3 million deaths worldwide attributed to, and that is about equivalent to the amount of deaths from both malaria and HIV combined. Uh, Dr. Gedehun coordinates the global One Health motile sectorial response to AMR across human, animal, plant, food and feed and environment sectors. Uh, he also directs the secretariat uh, of the Global Leaders Group on AMR, which is currently co-chaired by uh, their Excellencies, Prime Minister of both Barbados and Bangladesh. Uh, he facilitates the R&D agenda through various priority setting and gap analysis uh, and provides policy programmatic guidance to ultimately nurture and scale up uh, a variety of evidence-based interventions to enhance antimicrobial stewardship, awareness, and behavior across various sectors. Uh, Dr. Gedehun was pr previously the director of the Secretariat of the United Nations Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, established by the UN Secretary General. Uh, and before that, he worked uh, in the Global Tuberculosis Program of WHO, uh, leading its work, uh, not just on TB, but also HIV and community care. Uh, Dr. Gedehun has a medical degree from uh, Addis Ababa University Medical Faculty, a master's in public Health from the uh, School of Public Health for University of Brussels, and a PhD uh, in Public Health and Epidemiology from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp and Ghent University. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Haile Asiskedo, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ira, for having me. It's, it's great to have you. Um, I would love to start off uh, basically by handing you the floor for a little bit, as we typically do, just to talk a little bit more about sort of the early days. If you could sort of take us into uh, everything from sort of where you grew up, a little bit of your uh, background and the development of your interests sort of at this intersection of medicine, public health and epidemiology, I think that would be a great way to get things started. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'm, 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 I'm from Ethiopia and I was born and grown up in, the, in Addis Ababa, which is the capital city of Ethiopia. And then I went uh, to medical school and uh, um, Addis Ababa Medical School in the, again in the faculty there. And after finishing my medical training, I went into the northern part of the country for uh, rural you know, service where I have served uh, for nearly three years there, uh, not only serving, but also really uh, establishing um, the foundation for my public health uh, interest uh, and for what actually I was able to do uh, today. And then I went uh, to uh, Belgium, uh, got scholarship from a Bel the Belgian government, and I went uh, uh, to Brussels to do my master's uh, in public health for one year. And while uh, I was preparing and I was going for my 
masters uh, in public health, I actually went uh, with with the data because while I was working in that rural area, where at that time actually there was no all weather road and there was no also running water and um, electricity. It was ru uh, really rural and uh, the development was also not like today. I was engaged in uh, research, which I happened to see, you know, uh, in my, people just popping up in my rural uh, center, crip, uh, you know, crippled people uh, with walking the stick. And, and I was uh, curious, what is this disease? And uh, tried to understand and asking them. And uh, interestingly, I was able to found that it's actually a neurologic disorder that is very endemic in that area. So I was, uh, I did a research uh, while I was still GP and still I wrote my first uh, paper actually using lantern. There was no electricity. And uh, then I, uh, you know, presented it. There was an international conference. And when I went for my master's, I went with that background and also while I was about to leave for my master's, there was epidemic that uh, of the same disease that has happened in other part of the region, uh, what we call uh, Amara region. And then I was called actually to investigate and report that epidemic. And I did a uh, report and once, uh, as soon as I finished that reporting of the epidemic of this uh, neurologic disease, uh, what we call neurolatrism, uh, uh, then I went for uh, my masters with that information and with that data. And there I happened to meet one of the conference uh, attendants where I was able to present uh, uh, in Belgium, and uh, where I interacted with him, and uh, then I was uh, able to actually publish that epidemic report on the Lancet during that time, and then I uh, interacted with him, and uh, now um, he passed away. Uh, his name is Professor Lambain, and he managed, uh, you know, we managed to get also a follow-up, you know, a PhD which I actually opted at that time to do it in a sandwich manner, which means I have to go back and really, I really want to go back and uh, serve. So I was uh, uh, doing that in a PhD you know, format and then uh, that's how all my public has uh, done. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I was also working on TV, uh, again, you know, looking uh, when, uh, you know, uh, trying to solve uh, as a young uh, doctor serving the rural area, really trying to solve problems. So it happened that the very first day I arrived in that rural center, it was actually what they call a mentally typical clinic day. And there were almost uh, nearly 500, you know, patients. And in those rural areas, you know, the people will come to sort of for a market. You know, the market happens once or twice a week. So they have to come and they have to uh, buy, you know, their kerosene, their oil. You know, these are essential items that they need to get from the town. So they have to do that in the morning and they have to come in the afternoon, collect their drug and then rush before the hyenas are out or before <laughs> it gets dark. So in that case, I was able to uh, see, I mean, uh, really quite a lot of people coming. And uh, then I said, wow, this is, uh, there is no time really to finish, you know, nearly 400, 500 patients like in four hours. So it was basically, you know, drug refill. You just yeah. drug refill. There is no that one-to-one -one clinician, you know, patient interaction. And then I said, okay, let's change this. Rather than having once a week, once a month, why don't we do it once a week? So we just divided those 500 into four. So that actually brought some interaction, uh, not only between the patients and the clinician, but even among the patients, you know, right. while we are, they are coming. So now, since there is no much, uh, too many people, they come to know each other and then they start to wait for us until we come back from lunch by sitting, you know, 
based on their locality because that's how we arranged it. And that goes also uh, the precursor for what I basically said to those patients. Oh, you know each other. Why don't you go back when you go back home? Why don't you meet regularly, talk to yeah. about your illness, you know, on weekdays, on, you know, other holidays. And then when you come and also actually you can also even refer, why don't you elect a leader among you? So that's what we call now a TB club approach yep. was established mm -hmm. just, just like that. And then what we did that time was always my colleagues, you know, working in the health center, we empowered the health, the leaders of those clubs, you know, those small, small patient groups. So when they go back to their uh, locality, and then when they find a suspect who could have a potential, you know, TB, you know, with chronic cough, yep. so they will refer. So by just writing a piece of paper saying, I, the TB club leader of this club, I referring this, patient to be seen by the center. So when those patients come with that referral paper, in order to you know, give um, incentive, they will uh, skip the line. It's not only skip the line, they will also be seen by the doctor because in the outpatient, it's not, you know, the doctor is a scarce, it's only for complicated cases. You know, normally it's a nurse that is the first line uh, visiting uh, you know, in the outpatient department. So that actually motivates, you know, because mm -hmm. it's not only motivating the club leader, but also motivates the patients to be seen by a doctor when they come, not only skipping, you know, the line. Right. So this incentive has resulted. And uh, actually, at some point, uh, I think within a year, 70% uh, of our cases, this is also published, uh, you may have seen it. So uh, I think between 60 to 70 percent of our patients were referred through yep. those, you know, community TB leaders. And this also helped for me to interact with WHO at that time when they came and they visited it. And then that actually opened my interaction with WHO. And that's uh, also why I ended up in having my work uh, in TB the first mm -hmm. time uh, mm -hmm. with, with, with WHO. So that's how I ended up in being WHO. Yeah, that, 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 that's outstanding. And I, I enjoyed sort of when I was looking at your uh, your papers in the literature and I saw sort of that, you know, the the neurolatherism into the TB clubs. I was like, wow, you know, here's a, a really small, rare issue. And then you, you get the biggest issue, <laughs> the TB, and you have this very elegant approach in terms, as you were saying, about these clubs. Um, then... As you said, that leads you to your first role um, at WHO, where you're not just dealing with, you know, the biggest problem, the tuberculosis, 8.9 million new cases a year, 1.7 million deaths, but also HIV uh, and sort of this dual TB HIV initiative. And you published also extensively on this, talking about uh, the important relationship between these two diseases and ultimately how they're managed about how if you could properly design a uh, tuberculosis program uh, you know it's very important in the same sense to managing preventing diagnosing hiv uh, the resource component between the two talk a little bit about this because i can assume you know when you show up at who and you're <laughs> handed both of these to, you know a, sort of an integrated management of it it's a big job, right? <laughs> or you please tell us a little bit yeah. about that era. Yeah, so I think the interlink between tuberculosis and HIV, you know, we know it ever since uh, the first cases of HIV appear in early right. 80s. Yeah? Uh, but we were not able to do something until very late. And there have been several attempts uh, in the mid 80s and most impor uh, importantly also in late late 80s and early 90s mm -hmm. and uh, there were efforts also to introduce you know to pre prevention treatment for HIV positives but it was all uh, uh, not adequate and even you know the cases were increasing and uh, mortality was also increasing but with the advent of 3 by 5 and also antiretroviral drugs, you know, the 3 by 5 is the, you know, yep. 3 million people by 2005, which I was also part of uh, that, that initiative, you know, representing TB. 
when there is more coverage on uh, antiretroviral treatment and when people are actually not dying and trying to you know uh, start living uh, the tb was become very apparent that it is actually the lead killer among people living with hiv yep. so then when you really look at the system how these two diseases are managed in most parts of the world is by two different uh, separate entities. Uh, oftentimes, the HIV programs are very much empowered because of the political uh, momentum and support it gets, and uh, they are at higher levels than the TV program manager, which is a technocrat at a lower stage. So there was clear power imbalance, and that power imbalance, you know, uh, leads into non-communication and non-coordination and uh, all the inefficiencies that uh, one would expect. And that actually continuously uh, continued to cost life. So that's why by, uh, by coincidence, by the time I uh, arrived also in, in WHO, there was all this initiative. So I was uh, fortunate enough to be given the task actually to develop the first TBHIV policy. Uh, I was working before that actually on uh, uh, in uh, in uh, the National Family Planning Association in Ethiopia as a youth uh, program coordinator, where I was working on uh, sexual and reproductive health and integration of you know family planning into youth services. So I have some idea of how integration could be done, but not yeah. really with a clear you know TB HIV and HIV was also a, a very developing. Uh, you know, entity during those days with the advent of uh, ART and also the expansion of the diagnosis, the uh, uh, emergence uh, rapid test. So it was a uh, different. Um, so then I was uh, able to actually develop the first uh, TBHIV, you know, policy, which we call interim at that time because the evidence wasn't complete. However, we also appreciated the extent of the problem is so severe that we can't wait until the evidence is complete. Yeah. So that's why we call it interim policy. Uh, most of it was also expert opinion, but at the same time, we also developed the uh, priority research questions actually to answer the remaining gaps while doing all those uh, you know, policy interventions. And that TBHIV policy has 12 what we call collaborative TBHIV activities, you know, structured in such a way that first there should be, you know, interaction, collaboration between the two programs, and then there should be interventions to reduce HIV in TB patients, and there are, there should be the third category is TB prevention for HIV people as well. So it's complementary. So we have to serve the HIV patients, we have to serve the TB patients, but also those with the comorbidity. Right. So the policy gives that clarity. And then we engaged uh, also, you know, fortunately, again, you know, PEPFAR comes, the global fund comes, you know, the global financing opportunity to support these programs uh, was, was was has also increased. So that actually led into this scale up of interventions where for which I have been uh, uh, you know managing for more than a decade actually mm -hmm. until I, I joined the AMR world. And uh, I'm uh, very much you know happy to say the extent and the scale up of uh, that policy and mm -hmm. also the interventions has actually been now you know a global program and has saved millions and millions of lives. Excellent. Excellent. And yeah, as you're saying, you, you, you've you segued now into this new role, as mentioned, Director of Antimicrobial Resistance, Global Coordination. And obviously, the the scope is extremely broad in, in, in this current position. Uh, again, you've, you've been publishing some very interesting work uh, in recent months. Uh, one um, recent paper was on the, the World Health Organization Essential Medicines uh, Aware Book, the, the list of proper prescribing and sort of looking at the sort of things from sort of the, the human antibiotic prescribing side of things. But then you also, uh, there was another paper uh, that was really fascinating, identifying global research gaps to mitigate antimicrobial resistance, where you sort of 
go further uh, and you say, look, this is a human health issue. Uh, inappropriate prescribing is one piece of this, but uh, we have inappropriate overprescribing in animal health, uh, the food and feed industry, the plant and crop industry. I mean, this is there's a lot of pieces to, to AMR that we think don't normally think of. Talk a little bit about this new role and a little bit of sort of the, the broad spectrum of your responsibility and the things that you have to think about when you think about AMR. Yeah, so I think uh, AMR is, you know, I, I don't often like to say it's a complex problem. The complexity of antimicrobial resistance uh, emanates with the fact that we actually share mm -hmm. antimicrobials, uh, which means antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, antiprotozoal, with between humans and animals and even plants. Um, so, this actually brings the extent of complexity of the problem uh, because we have to, if we have to address antimicrobial resistance, we have to be concerned with humans, animals, plants, and even mm -hmm. the environment because whatever antimicrobial will be excreted and goes to the, in, uh, to the environment. So that's why uh, AMR uh, has been, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm also again uh, privileged. My first work with AMR was to uh, serve as uh, a director for the interagency coordination group, which was actually established by the 2016 political declaration uh, of uh, AMR. Uh, by you know global uh, political leaders, uh, which instructed uh, the uh, secretary general to establish it, and he established it. And I was able to, uh, I was fortunate enough to be the director for the last year of uh, of that uh, of that group, mm -hmm. where we uh, facilitated as a secretariat the work of the group to. Uh, basically set recommendations as required uh, by the political declaration, what needs to be done, you know, uh, right. for addressing AMR. So that recommendation, as uh, the, the intelligence coordination group recommendation gave uh, clear recommendations uh, for the global world. And that report was uh, submitted to the secretary general and then uh, the secretary general, you know, based on that, also uh, wrote, you know, his report to member states. And then he said, now it's high time that we have to address uh, in a much more practical way the multi-sectoral challenge of antimicrobial resistance. And mm -hmm. he uh, asked the that time what the tripartite uh, organizations, uh, because the UN environment. Although we were working, was there was no, you know, legalized uh, form, fund, formalized arrangement with them. So he asked the Food and Admin Agriculture Organization, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and uh, the World Animal Health Organization, as it is now known, uh, which was OIE, founded as OIE, mm -hmm. to establish a joint secretariat to address uh, this uh, complexity and multi-sectoral response, one is the response of AMR. So I was also uh, able uh, you know, to give the opportunity also to lead you know, that secretariat, starting from its uh, you know, establishment, which was established actually in 2019, and uh, to reach where we are. And also to implement <clears throat> one of the work of the uh, secretariat was also to implement the interagency coordination recommendations, which also includes establishment of critical governance uh, structures, which also includes the global leaders group, right. which you mentioned earlier, because we need political action for AMR and the global leaders group will bring that necessary global political attention in order to also yield impact at country level and there are also other <clears throat> recommendations uh, in, around the governance uh, like the partnership platform where we want to bring you know governments 
private sector, civil society, and academia to come together and to have shared vision. And this has also been established uh, as part of the Secretariat, but primarily run by the Food and Other Agriculture Organization. And we have also uh, done uh, quite a lot of joint work. So now our uh, Secretariat is uh, uh, has full-time liaison officers uh, working uh, uh, under the Secretariat uh, with me, but uh, within their own parent organization in FAO, OIE, WOHA, and the UN environment. The UN environment has formally joined the uh, tripartite, and now we are called quadripartite joint secretariat. We have right. four positions because environment has been uh, neglected uh, to be uh, you know, blunt uh in the past and now we have to address and we have to you know see environment uh interventions environment dimensions as one key part of the AMR response so that's what the secretariat that i am directing is is, is doing in, in in a nutshell excellent excellent and, you know, as you know, you mentioned, uh, and I mentioned in the bio, you just mentioned the the Global Leaders Group, uh, which, you know, has this, you know, mission of, you know, working to accelerate political momentum, leadership and action on AMR. And, you know, you're there uh, involved with uh, prime, active prime ministers of, of both Bangladesh, of Barbados, a variety of other uh, health ministers. Um, talk, can you just talk a little bit? Because, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated by, you know, clearly we mentioned the numbers at the beginning. Okay, 2019, 1.27 million deaths. I think that the, the number that, you know, is projected into the, I think, 2030 is, in, you know, close to 10 million. I mean, this is a, a major, major health, public health issue. What, can you just talk a little bit about sort of, how this group works, what it was like setting it up, and a little bit of uh, your interact, you know, how you lead this. Because I mean, I was looking at some of the uh, sort of the priority areas, and they're everything from you know how transforming our ecosystems, uh, doing R and D into novel antimicrobials, vaccines, and so forth. And obviously, you know, antimicrobial R and D in this area is kind of tough. Uh, you know, not a lot of uh, we discussed on the past show, like uh, not a lot of pharmaceutical companies do antimicrobial research anymore. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of the, uh, the sort of the, the uniqueness of running a, uh, a managing a group like this with so many sort of broad uh, priorities. Yeah, so uh, as I said, the Global Leaders Group was one of the recommendations uh, from the Interagency Coordination Group when they presented their report to the Secretary General in uh, 2019. So what we did uh, actually was, you know, uh, recognizing, I mean, the ICG recommendation recognizes the importance of political action. Political action means bringing political commitment, bringing uh, financing, bringing action at country level. And uh, in order to drive this the, and also to keep the AMR agenda high, on uh, global political and national political uh, uh, spheres, yep. it is critically important. So that's why we took the uh, establishment of the Global Leaders Group as a priority. And when we do that, we want also to be as transparent and as engaging as possible. So what we did was to also develop the terms of reference and to have before to have consultations and then based on that to develop the terms of reference and then we put we posted the terms of reference for public public discussion and then we revised it and then after we have open call uh, yeah. for political leaders it's not only political leaders i mean it's the global leaders from you know the private sector right. from academia from the civil society so it's really a mix of every one, and it's also should be representing all sectors, uh, the human health, the animal, the agri-food system, and the environment. So initially, when it was established in 2020, it was following a really an open call of uh, applications and expression of interest. So we have established it. Once it was also established, we oftentimes, you know, there is a concern that this level of high, you know, high level groups often are talking shops rather than, you know, action oriented. 
Mm-hmm. So what we did was the Global Leaders Group to develop an action plan that actually really guide its uh, its actions, its activities, and uh, also to have key performance indicator where it will measure its success and uh, uh, again is measurable, you know, key performance uh, uh, indicators. And that is how we started, and that is how this Global Leaders Group. We, it's, it, it's function just to, to let you one one example uh, when they first uh, developed their action plan uh, in uh, you know July uh, 2020 uh, that was you know one of the key performance indicator was to advocate to have a UN General Assembly high level meeting on a mar either in 2024 or 2026. So that advocacy has yielded, and in March 2022, the General Assembly has actually issued a resolution that called for high-level meeting uh, on AMR in 2024. Mm-hmm. And the Global Leaders Group has also been very uh, critical in uh, bringing uh, affirmative conclusion for the long, five-year-long discussion around the Codex uh, and AMR negotiations. Mm-hmm. Uh, which actually also help you know our global response for for AMR. So its priority, you know, its action plan has identified six priority areas, which some of which you have you know mentioned earlier. Uh, first is really to keep the political attention for AMR high, and also transforming systems. And whenever you know whatever uh, the leaders group is doing. It is encompassing all sectors. We look at it in a broader, comprehensive uh, manner, responding to the one health uh, spectrum of, of AMR. And uh, the third is also to catalyze research and development. It's not about research and development, uh, not only about antimicrobials, but right. also other uh, issue, uh, critical uh, uh, tools that will be critical for uh, addressing AMR across all sectors. For example, one of the challenge uh, is uh, the use of antibiotics uh, for non-veterinary indications, like right. in the food system, yep. like in growth promotion, although it's uh, increasingly being reduced. So for that, uh, the, another good you know, advocacy would be to implement to uh, uh, research and development on alternatives to antimicrobials for that right. type of purpose. So Global Leaders Group will catalyze, you know, all those uh, initiatives but in a broader, in a broader way. It will also take uh, the financing. I think financing is critically important. As right. I was trying to mention earlier, the whole uh, uh, paradigm for the TB and the HIV and the malaria respond well, particularly for resource limited settings changed because of the global fund, because of PEPFAR, because of you know other global fund financing mechanisms, right. which doesn't exist uh, for AMR as we speak. Although it is the top most killer, yep. and uh, countries are not. Uh, we have plans in. You know, uh, 100, uh, nearly 170 countries, they said they have national action plans. But it's only 20% of those countries, they, they, they are actually implementing those right. national action plans with uh, funding. So funding is a real, real, real uh, bottleneck, you know, for our uh, action around uh, AMR, you know, across all sectors. Right? It's not only human or animal, it's environment, it's uh, agri food system. Right. So we have to, uh, so that's why the Global Leaders Group has prioritized the financing as one of its, uh, you know, six uh, six uh, areas. Yep. And the other one, uh, the last one is also the environment uh, dimensions. As I said, it has been uh, neglected, but the Global Leaders Group uh, picked it up. And since uh, since actually it picked it up, there has been quite uh, major major developments about the importance and uh, integration of uh, environment dimensions in the global AMR response. Mm-hmm. 
It's interesting, you know, as we talk about innovation, um, there was a uh, uh, WHO uh, news release really, back in June of 2022 was entitled Lack of Innovation Set to Undermine Antibiotic Performance and Health Gains. And, and you're quoted in this talking about sort of, uh, you know, time is running out on this one and we really got to spend a lot more time and money innovating, as you were saying. And it, and in the in the report, it talks about, you know, okay, uh, there's something like 77 new antibacterial agents in development, uh, about half of, a little more than half of those are traditional small molecules, but then it said about 32 are non-traditional agents, and you gave examples in here of things like monoclonal antibodies, of course, which obviously are ex extremely expensive and hard to make, but it also points out things like bacteriophage. Uh, you know, here's a, a technology that's literally, you know, 100 years uh, old and, and sort of never been taken on, you know, in a major sense around the world, but uh Oh, these viruses are really good at killing microbes. So, so I'm just interested from your perspective. You know, what, what excites you in terms of some of these innovations? Are, are, you, are you more excited in sort of the, the 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 monoclonals and some of the biotech stuff, or you, the you know the the more traditional stuff that we may want to see more of that's cheaper to develop? What 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 gets you excited? And you know, if you had sort of, I posed this question on the show. If you had you know a trillion dollars to hand out to do a lot of this work. Where would you be putting it in terms of some of these new interventions? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the development of uh, antibiotics, you know, particularly, uh, is, is, is incredibly worrisome. Uh, right. Because for the last uh, 20 years, uh, the big pharma actually exits the research and development of, of antibiotics. And right. also, although small and medium enterprises are the ones uh, trying to fill the gap. And, you know, because uh, markets, the business model is not, is not working. So right. uh, because it's not uh, this antibiotics, the new antibiotics, you know, will be for limited number of uh, patients. So the market is not attractive enough, you know, from business uh, orientation. Uh, so that actually is a major, a major challenge uh, uh, where we need uh, creative solutions. And there are uh, discussions, uh, what we call around, you know, push and pull mechanism. And uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, in, in initiatives like, the GARDP, you know, CARBEX, uh, AMR Action Fund, where right. the sector also put, you know, uh, money, you know, to advance the uh, innovation of new, new uh, antibiotics. And, but these are not enough. And right. uh, it's not only the number of initiatives, but the amount of funding that is available uh, for their work is not, is not adequate. And yeah. we have also, we have to have a new, uh, you know, way of mechanism. Uh, there has been discussions uh, around uh, how to enhance the private sector, uh, uh, you know, incentivize the private sector for more research and development, uh, push and uh, the pull, the pull mechanisms uh, where some countries like in the UK, where they have already started some, you know, promising commitments, but in others, it's almost always discussion. So I think, there are some fundamental uh, challenges and fundamental issues for which we have an honest and candid discussion and really find a way. It has to be both the private sector and the government in, 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 a, in a creative way that we have to address this. Otherwise, we will end up in, 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 a, in a situation where, you know, normal, uh, you know, easy to treat infections will be fatal. And uh, when, you know, WHO uh, does the pipeline uh, analysis of uh, antibacterial development every year, and uh, both the preclinical and the clinical. So the number of uh, molecules that actually pass from the preclinical to the clinical are, are, are very few. And yeah. uh, this also has um, um, inherent uh, inherent challenge in a way, and uh, then from being in the clinical from phase one to you know phase three is also uh, you know a challenge. So it's 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 there are really uh, major inherent uh, you know external and uh, internal internal challenges how to ensure. Right. But at the same time, 
the problem is not only for antibiotics uh, for for human, but it's also in other sectors. Uh, yep. If, for example, if we have creative technology or innovations for the uh, veterinary services for animal health. Uh, that will ensure that there is no uh, infection uh, or uh, you know, good biosecurity practices. So that will lead into less use of antimicrobials, antibiotics, which again lead into less risk and selection for resistance. So I think the research and development you know, challenge is, is, is multifaceted and is huge. So I think that is why we have recently, actually, uh, we are currently finalizing the priority research agenda across uh, one health spectrum for a MAR, really to also guide all our efforts. Where do we need, you know, research? Uh, right. The billion, uh, you know, uh, question you raised earlier. So we have to put all these uh, uh, priority uh, areas, priority pathogens. Uh, we have uh, since 2017, we developed priority bacterial uh, pathogens uh, for which we actually monitor the development of uh, antibacterial you know, treatment, both yeah. traditional and non-traditional. And uh, we recently also uh, published the priority fungal pathogen list, again, to guide uh, also, the fungal one, we still need more more evidence um, really to understand, and mostly it is for being agile around that, uh, and we recognize the greatest burden, as you said earlier, you know, having 1.3 million deaths every year is a bacterial one. Right. But we we can't also you know uh, sit folding our arms be for the fungal one, so that is why we yeah. have identified. Uh, 19 uh, priority fungal uh, pathogen list, part, um, principally uh, for surveillance uh, purposes, really to understand if we have good surveillance system, we will understand the magnitude because we don't know how much are fungal infections and uh, how, how much of that are also caused by, uh, by resistance. But we know the pipeline uh, in fungal is even much worse than you know, the bacteria. And the number of diagnostics, uh, the tools we have is also very, very limited. So yeah. it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, situation that we have to really look in a pragmatic in a pragmatic way, and uh, we are playing our role uh, as as, as quadripartite to address it in a broader in a broader way. Excellent. You know, it's, it's as you you know you talk about sort of this human animal plant environment interface you know you re you're referring to you know this this really important theme that we talk a lot about on the show namely one health um yet a lot of it as, as, as you were just you know uh hinting at a lot of what we have heard about on terms of the one health concerns has been on the viral front that you know there's a lot of unknowns out there that you know and we're concerned about the ones a la SARS and MERS and so forth that spill over occasionally and we need to go out there and hunt and, and, and figure out you know where the next problems are coming from you know you're just pointing out something important you know, you know if it's not uh, uh, on the, the the list of concerning bacteria or the concerning concerning fungi or protozoa or whatever it may be there's a, probably a lot of other things out there that uh, we don't know about yet, but we need to be thinking about. And I'm, I'm just interested in, you know, as you are involved, I know, you know, WHO has been putting out paper, you know, like the One Health Joint Plan of Action recently in October. Um, as you think about sort of your colleagues that are thinking about One Health per viral spillover issues, what are some of the similarities the the collab i mean talk a little bit about how one health in this amr domain can either benefit from or learn from what's going on on the viral side and vice versa yeah so i think one has that's oftentimes you know there is uh you know conceptual uh, uh you know errors around it but uh the one has high level you know expert panel actually provided an excellent uh definition of what one health means. Uh, basically, one health is a really an umbrella, how we you know, live with 
or our you know ecosystem and the environment and animals and humans. So it is, uh, you know, I know I uh, analog it like with you know as an umbrella where you will have different you know areas. So one health is really we have to work. For example, for uh, uh, AMR, you know, when we call one health, we have to deal with the plants, we have to deal with the animals, we have to deal with the environment. So, uh, and, but having having that, we have to really look across these different uh, sectors. There is no one health program by itself, and there yeah. will be no one health program. Uh, but it is an approach, it is uh, an umbrella for which will bring us together to work together and uh, find solutions you know, together. So I think that is, that is important. And this is, uh, as I said earlier, is benefiting, uh, benefiting AMR. For example, uh, if I speak, uh, you know, some of our priority areas, uh, one, what we are really trying to do is regulation is important. Right. So if you regulate, for example, over-the-counter sale of antibiotics only for humans, but you ignored or you didn't address over-the-counter sale of antibiotics for animals, you won't have to, you know, address the AMR problem. Yeah. So that's why, uh, as part of this, we are uh, think, we are planning to bring the human medicine regulators and the animal medicine regulators, and these agencies, you know, like uh, the FDA is the one, like the US. These agencies in sixty four countries, in sixty four percent of countries, they are separate. They report to separate ministries. So it's very hard for these agencies, you know, regulators to coordinate. Uh, and most of the time, as you know, they are also very powerful structures. Yeah. So that is why, you know, as part of our quadripartite, you know, joint secretariat, we are bringing uh, those two. So this is, a, you know, the, the fruit of working in a one health spectrum. So now we will bring the animal health regulators, the, the animal medicine regulators and the human medicine regulators. And then we will discuss a joint uh, you know, proposal, how to how to prevent or how to address uh, over-the-counter and internet sale of antibiotics. Right. For that, we have already co conducting uh, pre-summit uh, consultations, you know, global consultations across different sectors to get some ideas, some ideas of solutions to be discussed uh, with the regulators. So I, I think the, the, and also we have uh, what we call the critical important antimicrobial list, where we have identified a certain list is important, you know, for um, human medicine and a certain list is important for veterinary medicine. And ultimately, we are really trying also to harmonize, you know, those right. And really to have what are the antibiotics and the antimicrobials that we have to actually protect, not all, you know, for both human and veterinary veterinary use. So I think we are also, you know, going in that in that direction. So I think there is quite a lot of benefits, you know, uh, of a mark if we work through a, a one health lens. Excellent, excellent. Dr. Gedun, um, just coming back to sort of the beginning of your journey here, and in, as, as we talked a lot about, uh, you know, your time in the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia and your work on TB, um, you know, we've just entered 2023. Um, I, uh, you know, the last I looked at BCG vaccine was developed back in 1921. Um uh, some of the anti-tubercular drugs we're still working with were from the 1940s. Can you just give us a couple minutes on your feelings on, I mean, obviously TB falls outside the AMR <laughs> domain technically, but it still has the same problems. Um, any 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 insight you can give us on TB while we have you based on your long experience and where you hope to see things happening uh, or evolving uh, 2023 in terms of our uh, our push against this major killer? Yeah, I, I think I am a bit uh, not closely following, you know, the latest uh, what's happening in the uh, pipeline in the diagnostics uh, uh, of, of TB. But if we really look what has happened in the last uh, 15 years uh, in TB, 
it has been a major revolution. Okay. Uh, in uh, early 2000, microscopy was the only the only uh, in, uh, diagnostics, and we know microscopy only picks between 20 to 40 percent of of, of cases. Got and it. actually, it was part of my early work. Uh, most HIV positive patients were smear negative. They, you know, they, you can't find their TB using the smear microscopy. So that was what has actually led uh, that uh, the sort of uh, movement that we have to address smear negative TB in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that discussion among, uh, and I'm also, you know, part of, um, you know, that that discussion, and I we actually published our um, uh, policy analysis uh, calling for urgent policy change uh, on, on the Lancet, I think uh, 2006, or, uh, where we actually stated that it is, you know, it is high time. We can't rely only on microscopy, right. and especially for HIV uh, positive uh, people. So that led into this debate and discussion even to going to the extent, because during that time, the WHO recommended a TB strategy was what we call DOTS, the DOTS strategy. So for the DOTS strategy, a smear microscopy is the major pillar. So if you are not smear positive, if you are smear negative, you know, you are not, uh, the patient is not you know, a priority for the program. Mm -hmm. So this debate and discussion actually led also for the DOTS strategy, you know, to be revisited, to be relooked, which later on becomes a stop TB strategy, which actually gave due emphasis for uh, for smear negative uh, TB, which again, uh, as part of our work on TB HIV, we brought, you know, HIV activists, HIV researchers, actually to debate and discuss. And this has uh, led uh, uh, what we call now, you know, gene expert. And I remember when the first time the result was uh, uh, the positive result of the gene expert was was presented was in uh, in uh, I think 2009 in a meeting which we organized uh, an HIV meeting we organized in in Cape Town. And uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, actually now you see it has been. Um, you know, transformational. Similarly, in the diagnosis of, of and treatment uh, of drug resistant TB has right. actually, you know, shown you know encouraging uh, you know progress over the last uh, the last uh, fifteen years. Excellent, excellent. I, I appreciate you uh, you updating us on that. Um, while we have you, one last thing. I know the little sign behind you talks about the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Um, any other initiatives coming up, uh, things that you have planned uh, for 2023, conferences you're going to be presenting at, speaking events, other uh, public engagement uh, work, anything else that I missed, please take the floor and, and, and tell us. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we want, you know, AMR shouldn't only be a one week you know, World well, Antimicrobial Awareness Week business, but I think that is our major opportunity to have some global uh, momentum. And mm -hmm. uh, we work across, you know, the four organizations in my under the Joint Secretariat to have, you know, a harmonized messaging, harmonized approach. And we've been doing that for the last um, three years now. And that actually keeps uh, momentum. But I think the most important thing is around uh, awareness uh, in general. Uh, that's a major, major challenge. And we want uh, the youth to be part of this um, uh, journey. This is a uh, uh, fight uh, against antimicrobial resistance uh, because if um, uh, we have, you know, the, good uh, the young generation you know uh, take anti uh, antimicrobial resistance as a trait like right. climate crisis uh, for yeah. their future i think we it, will, it, it has to be done it has to be done so as part of that we are also looking all the opportunities uh, of youth engagement and uh, also making sure uh, you know amr keeps a high high in the political agenda as well so that's um what uh, we will be doing. 
Well, we will uh, help you spread the word and help uh, continue to root you on as you champion this most important of public health issues. Um, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Dr. Halie Siskethun, Director of Antimicrobial Resistance, Global Coordination at the World Health Organization, also Director of the Quadripartite Joint Secretariat on Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, Dr. Gedehun, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about these topics. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing. And as we like to say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for everybody of you, the work you're doing. It's a really very impressive story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Thank you very much.